All right, hello everyone and welcome to the Third Coast Water Seminar. My name is Elena Harkness and I'm the Executive Director of Current. And on behalf of all of the Third Coast uh, presenters on your screen, Northwestern University, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, Argonne National Laboratory, the University of Illinois at Chicago, and the University of Chicago, I'm really pleased to welcome here you all here to the series that focuses on uh, innovative advances in water-focused research. If this is your first Third Coast, uh, it's a pretty simple format. We'd love for you to provide some active feedback to the speaker and share your questions in the Q&A tab and your comments in the chat tab. This event is being recorded, so you'll be able to access it following the event on Current's event page and via our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so you can receive notifications about future events as well. We have a simple agenda today. Um, I'll do a few more words of remarks and context about Current and what we do and why we're here, and then introduce uh, one of the co-creators of the Third Coast Water Innovation Series, Marcelo Garcia uh, from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He will then introduce our featured speaker today, Dr. Ashlyn Stillwell, uh, to speak with us on the topic of the energy water nexus and smarter cities, which I am very excited about. And then we'll do audience Q&A throughout, so please don't forget to use the chat and Q&A for that. And we'll wrap you up and get you out right before the top of the hour. So a bit more context on current. If you're just getting introduced to us, we are Chicago's water innovation hub and we're five years young this year. Our job is to spark collaborations like this event, to grow an inclusive blue economy, help to accelerate innovation and in water technology, and solve persistent water challenges. That's our goal. This is a global challenge. All of the water issues we face around the world are also coming to ground here in our headquarters home in Chicago. We all agree that we need more healthy water to drink in our homes and less flood water in our basements, more protected coastlines. These are some of the big challenges we face here in the Great Lakes, but we know there's other water challenges that are affecting people all over the world, like water scarcity, affecting up to two thirds of the world's population in just a few short years. Like climate change, the damaging rains that we've seen in Western Europe in the past weeks, uh, the droughts affecting the West Coast of this country, um, all of this means we all have to get smarter about how we adapt to climate change. Water quality, taking stock of what's in the water now and keeping track of emerging contaminants like PFAS, PFOAs, microplastics, trying to understand how we keep our water safe. At Current, we think that one of the big problems is that there's great ideas out there, but people aren't rallying fast enough behind the new ideas and technologies that will protect our water, our health, the environment. So we know that water innovation is really hard. And some of the speakers in the series have illustrated in great detail why that is. And often solving water challenges takes collaboration, which is why Current exists, to build the partnerships that enable uh, faster innovation and, and smarter adoption of new technologies. We exist to be an unbiased advocate for the best water solutions and policies. So we try to stay on top of the latest if it's working. We bring it right here, what's emerging from uh, our best research universities and national labs. We try to independently assess that technology and recommend the best solutions for others to pilot in the real world. Some of the things we're working on that we're excited about, sewage surveillance, an opportunity that's come up uh, because of COVID-19, and using wastewater as an early warning indicator for public health more broadly. It's a really exciting frontier of science, and we're working with many of the partners in the Third Coast series uh, on a really exciting project to uh, identify better ways to do that. PFAS elimination, as I mentioned, this emerging contaminant, it's a class of emerging contaminants is a big threat to the water supply, and we're working with uh, companies and researchers to find better ways to target and destroy these chemicals. And thermal energy recovery, this is the segue to today's topic, but uh, Current's working with support from the Water Research Foundation uh, to understand how heat is captured and recovered from wastewater to be used as a renewable energy source. So we've got a research project underway looking at some of the best instances of that and technologies that could be used to support uh, large developments uh, in the future. So with that as a transition, I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Ashlyn Stillwell here to speak with us today uh, on this really important topic, meeting the world's demands for decarbonization and the aggressive targets that you know, are being raised every day, hopefully, in order to uh, affect a better climate future for all of us, will require smarter ways of using water to meet those needs. And Ashlyn's going to 
walk us through some of the science behind that, some of the frontier opportunities. Um, and to introduce her, I'd like to turn it over to our very good friend and collaborator, Marcelo Garcia, who is the MG Jeffrey Ye Endowed Chair in Civil Engineering and Director of the Vente Chao Hydro Systems Laboratory at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Marcelo is also one of the founders of the Third Coast Series, and we're so happy to have him here with us today. So Marcelo, over to you to introduce Ashlyn. Thank you, Elena. So today is my honor and privilege to introduce um, uh, Professor Ashlyn uh, Stilwell. Ashlyn um, is a um, faculty scholar here in our department, the Bill and Elaine Hall um, faculty scholar. Um, she has been here since 2013, 2014, and has developed a, an excellent um, program undertaking the nexus between uh, water and, and energy and policy as well. Uh, she received her undergraduate education at the University of Missouri at Columbia in chemical engineering, and then went on to the University of uh, Texas, uh, Austin, where she received a master's degree in uh, water resources and environmental engineering, as well as a master's degree in public affairs. Um, after receiving her uh, PhD in 2013 um, in civil and environmental engineering, she joined the faculty immediately after um, the faculty of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She has uh, received a lot of recognition, among them um, NSF Early Career Award, um, the UCAR, University Council of Water Resources Early Career Award for Applied Research, for her research work on the energy uh, water nexus. And, and also she has been uh, um, recognized for her service with the 2015 Girl Scouts of Central Illinois Women of Distinction Award in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Um, he is uh, commonly uh, uh, a member of a distinguished group of uh, professors, faculty uh, ranked as excellent in teaching by the students. And because of that, she received in 2018 the American uh, Environmental Engineering uh, Society uh, and Science Professors Award for outstanding teaching as well. Okay. So, um, Ashlyn, uh, it's um, is usually um, a great speaker. She is the daughter of uh, teachers, and she has inherited um, those skills that not everybody has. So with that introduction, it is my pleasure to uh, present um, Dr. Ashley Stilwell. Thank you, Marcelo. All right, I'm excited to talk with you today about the work that my students and I have been doing on the energy water nexus, specifically looking at cities, and I'll refer to them as smarter cities in this context. When I think about water in cities, and I define cities quite broadly because my hometown, when I was growing up there, has about 3,500 people. So uh, a city can range in size from my perspective. Um, when I think about water in that built environment of a city, there's a lot of aspects of our natural environment and also our human engineered environment. And some of them we'll kind of dig through today. So if we think about what happens for humans that live in buildings, we have some supply of water, drinking water that's been treated to federal standards to then supply the needs of those humans in the built environment, but some of that water doesn't make it all the way to those individuals. And we call that non-revenue water, all pipes leak. How much is that? Well, that's a, a question that we've been exploring. After we use water then inside the built environment, it becomes wastewater. And there's also the interaction that then happens with the natural environment where rainfall could become stormwater runoff, perhaps in cities like Chicago and other, I'm in Kansas City, I'm visiting my in-laws right now. So Kansas City is another city where this wastewater effluent flow and stormwater runoff are combined into a single flow. And the important thing when we start to think about the energy water nexus is that these 
engineered flows require energy for moving, treating water and pressurizing it and heating it. So if we go back to water supply, there is an amount of energy for water that is required to treat that drinking water to appropriate standards and pump it to customers. And consequently, because not all of that water makes it to a customer, there's some amount of energy that is lost with that non-revenue water. On the opposite side of our water system, there is energy associated with wastewater. So to Elena's earlier point, we can recover some of that thermal energy from wastewater, but we as sanitary engineers are investing more energy into wastewater to treat it to appropriate discharge standards. And if we start to think about something like circularity or circular water economy, reclaiming some of that treated wastewater effluent and recycling it to perhaps offset some of our drinking water demands also requires energy. So there's energy associated with our city-based or urban-based water sector at all of these steps along the way. And in the time we have today, I, I come with two questions that my group and I have been studying for several years now and are continuing to examine engineering questions and policy questions around energy and water as it relates to cities and urban environments. And so our first question is, what is the role of the energy water nexus in smart cities? If we're thinking about cities as a whole, what can we say about the energy water nexus itself? And then secondly, how are energy and water connected at the household level? Cities can be thought of as a collection of buildings. And truth is, Buildings don't use water and energy. Humans in buildings use water and energy. So what's happening at the household scale, the residential level is our second question here. So let's start with the first of what's the role of the energy water nexus in smart cities. And we started to answer this with another question of what urban water data are available. And we were focused in this particular study on the United States. And so we looked through different available data that were publicly accessible and unique to cities. And so there are a fair number of data sets out there that gave us some information, but unfortunately not exactly what we were looking for. The US Geological Survey conducts the National Water Census every five years. Those are unfortunately only county scale data and they include water withdrawals only, not water consumption within the county. And so a city like Los Angeles that gets a large portion of its drinking water supply from outside the county wouldn't necessarily show up in these USGS National Water Census data. Another nonprofit, Circle of Blue, publishes a fair amount of data around US cities, but that is mostly focused on water pricing, which is an important aspect of things like equity and affordability around water. But we were really trying to get down to water and energy, not necessarily economics. And so we then turn to the American Water Works Association. The AWWA publishes a, a report annually called Benchmarking Performance Indicators for Water and Wastewater Utilities. And it's a subscription-based report, so it's not freely available, but for research purposes, we went ahead and purchased a copy of it to see what can we discern about energy requirements for water and wastewater utilities in the United States. And some data are reported, but unfortunately, they are geographically aggregated. And so what the AWWA does is group the lower 48 United States into different regions and says the Southeast United States all kind of looks like this particular value of energy associated with water. And so we're kind of broadly assuming that say Georgia and South Carolina are not so different from each other because of things like climate and the region specificity. And there's some state level data out there. Uh, California and Texas do a decent job of collecting water utility based data, but by and large, we didn't have any national publicly accessible database of water and energy for that water and wastewater utilities in US cities. And so when you don't have data for something, 
and you do have an eager PhD student, what do you do? Well, you start collecting your own data. And so that's exactly what we did. We started contacting major US cities and their associated water and wastewater utilities and started asking, how much flow do you treat? How much energy does that require? And I could probably give an entire separate seminar on how difficult it was to collect those data because it took us nine months to go through a, a collection of those data. And um, in, in the end, we, long story short, we started with asking nicely. We started with who do we know at this water utility and asking around with phone calls and emails and Twitter was remarkably successful in getting the right person. And if that didn't work, then we went to formal record, open records requests. And uh, for those of you on, on the webinar that are from public utilities, that might make you cringe or draw a quick breath because open records requests are um, not exactly the nice way of asking. And, and so we went into this asking nicely to the extent we could, but we were often ignored and then went with open records requests. And the thing about open records requests are that uh, public utilities are legally required to respond to them. And these are, this is a summary of the data that we got and note that we didn't have a hundred percent response rate. So um, that's a little troubling in some respects, but we did learn a lot about drinking water and wastewater utilities in US cities and the different abilities to access information about water and energy. So in of these four pie charts, the column on the left represents drinking water utilities, column on the right is wastewater utilities. And when we look at flow, which is this top row, most utilities have an excellent handle on how much flow they treat, which makes a lot of sense, right? That's what they're in the business of doing is treating drinking water and or treating wastewater. And so we commonly got daily data in terms of flow. But when we look at energy, which is the bottom row here, we, we had a much tougher time getting daily resolution on energy consumption. A lot of times we would get detailed information about how much flow was treated from a particular operating facility. And then when we asked how much energy does it take to treat that flow, we got sent to an accounting department that sent us photocopies of utility bills. So there's, there's already this disconnect between water and energy, perhaps at the utility scale. And so we collected all of these data over a nine month period and aggregated them and then wanted to see what can we say about cities in the United States. And so this map and the following, the map on the following slide represent our data. And this one is for drinking water utilities. And the circle that you see is for the cities that responded to us. The size of the circle corresponds to the daily per capita drinking water consumption. And the color of the circle relates to the embedded energy. So units here, kilowatt hours per cubic meter, where the warmer colors, the reds and oranges, would represent higher embedded energy in treating those flows. And the cooler colors are lower embedded energy. Those that don't have any color either had no energy data reported or had energy data that didn't make a ton of sense. And so uh, I'm in Kansas City right now and Kansas City right here is an interesting example because they did report energy data, but they didn't make a lot of sense because they were two orders of magnitude higher than every other city that we had reported to us. So um, there's, there's this element of benchmarking in these data that we can start to say, how much energy do we use for US drinking water utilities? And our goal here was to get representation from each state across the 50 states and to start with large cities. Did we get everyone? Definitely not. We did the best we could here. But an interesting takeaway from all of this is that drinking water consumption, per capita drinking water consumption varies widely and embedded energy varies widely, such that grouping states regionally and reporting aggregate regional numbers like AWWA does, maybe doesn't make a ton of sense because even here in the state of Arizona, for example, there's significant differences across two cities. Or Minneapolis and St. Paul might be a better example because they're adjacent to each other and there's still large differences there. So, 
geographics don't exactly explain what's going on. There's other perspectives such that collecting these data on a regular basis and reporting them would help us have a better benchmark of how much energy are we using in our drinking water system. If we go to wastewater, similar sort of stories, so same format here, size of the circle corresponds to per capita wastewater generation per, uh, on a daily basis, and the color of the circle corresponds to embedded energy. The only real trends we see here geographically are a, a trend in kind of the, the industrial rust belt area and in cities that have combined sewers, which is not overly surprising. We would expect cities with combined sewers to have higher per capita wastewater flows than cities with separated sewers. And so what we learned from all of this is that it matters how much energy we're using for drinking water and wastewater utilities such that we should measure this and benchmark it on more than just a snapshot sort of basis like we did. If we zoom in temporally, we also learned some interesting things about the word energy. When we asked utilities for their data, we asked them for how much energy does it take to treat your flow? And we didn't intentionally phrase that vaguely, but energy can be electricity and also natural gas, propane, other primary fuels. And so many utilities reported all of their energy consumption. And what we noticed was a somewhat surprising um, trend across different climates. And this is just a smattering of cities to give you some perspective. Um, the vertical axis on each one of these don't necessarily match. So don't get too caught up in the vertical axis numbers. The horizontal axes are uniform throughout the year. So these are months on the horizontal axis. And if we look at a place like Dallas and Oklahoma City, we see trends that we would expect to see throughout the year where this solid white line represents drinking water volume that peaks in the summer and then goes down in the winter and spring. It is lower in the spring than it is in the fall and that, typ that corresponds to typical precipitation patterns. So this would be reflective of a lot of outdoor irrigation in the city, in Dallas and also Oklahoma City. And the dashed line is embedded energy that mimics that behavior. We have a similar behavior between the drinking water consumption and the embedded energy where for a fixed pipe diameter, it takes more energy to pump more water through the same fixed distribution system. So these, these trends for Dallas and Oklahoma City are not surprising at all. And what was surprising are the four others that you see on this slide. And these all happen to be cold climates. Um, Anchorage, Boston, Colorado Springs, and Salt Lake City had an inverse relationship between the drinking water volume and the embedded energy. So we still see this, this summer peak that is likely irrigation happening from additional drinking water consumption, but the embedded energy is actually higher in the winter time than it is in the summertime. And part of the reason for that is because we got information about both electricity for pumping and natural gas for facility heating. And that is a large amount of energy for these facilities that are located in colder climates. Just heating their buildings associated with the treatment process is a large amount of energy. And that includes both electricity and natural gas. While we were collecting data, we also asked cities how much non-revenue water they have. Uh, so this is just a color, a graduated color scale here. The main takeaway is that as infrastructure ages, we have more non-revenue water. More leakage happens either through physical leakage or metering inaccuracies and other um, measurement challenges along the way in older distribution networks than in younger distribution networks. And so this kind of emphasizes some of the US EPA and the, and the American Society of Civil Engineers conclusions that this is a big challenge and it's going to take a lot of money to rehabilitate our systems along the way. 45% non-revenue water is a lot. Almost half of what is treated never made it to a customer and was paid for. 
it's kind of alarming. So when we put all of this together and revisit our question of what's the role of the energy water nexus in smart cities, what we see is that it's important to think about both water and energy. A lot of times in this smart cities context and conversation, we think about really flashy visible things like smart street lights. And we don't necessarily think about what is happening at treatment plants outside the city or under our feet in the distribution and sewer systems. And we don't have a ton of data on those. Those water and wastewater utility data are not publicly reported in a centralized database. And when we go through the legwork to collect those data, we see that both primary and secondary energy sources are important. And those vary both spatially and temporally. When we put it all together and look at how much energy is associated with drinking water in the utilities that we surveyed and non-revenue water in those systems, non-revenue water requires about the same amount of energy as powering 300,000 US homes annually. So this is nothing to sneeze at, really. It's, it, it seems small on a percent basis, but when we scale it up to what is this amount of energy, well, it's about enough to support a small city. So the big takeaway there is if we're hyper-focused on energy solutions, taking a look at our water systems is an important route forward. So that's the city scale. Now let's shift gears and think about what's happening at the household scale or the residential scale, because that's a large part of what is happening in these larger city trends. We saw those, those peaks in water demand in the summer for things like outdoor irrigation. What does that mean for the individual home occupant? And so if we look at the US built environment, specifically the residential built environment, it's kind of a microcosm of the energy water nexus. Buildings are over 40% of US energy consumption and they are about 13% of total water withdrawals. So these two pie charts give us some perspective of what's happening inside the boundary of the home. On the left-hand side is residential energy consumption. And these data are collected by the Energy Information Administration as part of the DOE in the Residential Energy Consumption Survey. And it looks like comparing these two pie charts as if the energy consumption data are much older than the water consumption data. But the important thing to remember is that the energy consumption data are measured regularly and have been measured on a periodic basis every five to seven years since the 70s or so. And so the, the smattering of where is our energy going in our homes is in kind of coarse buckets, so to speak, from the initial collection of those data in the 70s. So most of our energy consumption in the residential environment is going to space heating. If we combine space heating with air conditioning and call that space conditioning in general, then over half of our energy consumption at home is going to keep us comfortable in the indoor environment. Water heating is an important second here at around 19%. And then we have refrigerators and this very large category of other at 25%. When there are further breakdowns of, of this 25%, it is all of the little things that plug in to the wall. And when EIA started collecting these data a long time ago, other was a really small category. It was, it was other, it was little because we didn't plug as many things in as we do now. So we've got a fairly good handle on what's happening on the energy side. On the water side, these data are from 2016, so they look like they're they are more recent, but this publication from the Water Research Foundation was only the second time that residential water consumption was studied in the United States. The first was 1999. So we don't have as good of a picture as to what's happening inside from a water perspective. At a national average, most of our water goes outdoors to grow a beautiful crop of green lawns. We're putting a lot of drinking water outside on the grass. Then if we move inside, we have a 
a distribution here of some things that most definitely require drinking quality water like faucets and showers that come into contact with humans and then things like toilets that don't require drinking quality water. The way we've plumbed our homes, however, is that all of the things in this right hand pie chart are drinking quality water. And with the exception of a few US cities, a lot of our grass irrigation is also happening with chlorinated drinking water. An important thing to remember before we dig into details, though, is that that 64% that is outdoor residential water consumption varies widely. In some arid cities, that can be 80 to 90 percent of total residential water consumption going outdoors. In some denser cities, like uh, for example, New York, where people don't have as many lawns to irrigate, that's a much smaller percentage of water that's going outdoors. So if we learned anything from the beginning part of this talk where, where it's hard to group cities together, it's also hard to group average households together and say, this is what it is specifically. If we look at averages, though, here's where we're at. And so what my students and I then worked on is understanding how can we be more efficient inside the residential environment. And we'll think about this from the perspective of both direct resource consumption and indirect resource consumption. And so I'll illustrate this with a clothes washer because it's probably the most complex of the typical residential appliances when it comes to water and energy. So if you think about the clothes washer itself, it plugs into the wall in an outlet, so it requires electricity. It also is plumbed to a water faucet, so it requires drinking water, and it is plumbed to a sewer connection. So it is generating wastewater, and we call those direct consumptions. So we have some amount of drinking water that goes in to the clothes washer, some amount of wastewater that comes out, some amount of electricity that goes in. Depending on human behavior, we might also have water heating on the premises of the residence that then goes to the clothes washer. So we count that as direct consumption because it's happening on the residential property. Each one of these direct consumptions though have an indirect consumption associated with them. This drinking water that goes into the clothes washer is a, an energy consumer because there's energy associated with treatment and distribution of that drinking water. And there's some amount of water that never made it there. So there's unaccounted for water that accompanies the drinking water that never makes it to the home into the clothes washer. Similarly with wastewater, we have energy associated with that. We have water associated with generating the electricity at a power plant and also in generating the electricity or the natural gas that is used for water heating to go into the clothes washer. And so we go through this inventory for each one of the residential appliances in the average US home. What is the direct consumption and indirect consumption of water and energy associated with these activities in our residential environment? And then what happens if we replace them with more efficient versions of that same appliance? Not thinking about things like behavior change, not thinking about things like rebound effects. What if I take my old clunky washing machine and I replace it with the most efficient thing on the market. And so we model that in what is called an abatement curve approach. And I recognize this is a really information dense diagram. This is abatement curve approaches are uh, commonly referred to as McKinsey curves that were popularized around the concept of carbon abatement. And the way to read these curves is the vertical axis here is the abatement cost. So this particular figure represents energy in the residential environment. And these individual bars here represent a different efficiency investment inside the home. So each one of these bars corresponds to the thing that they are labeled as, and we order them from low to high abatement cost. A negative abatement cost is something that saves money over the lifetime of that appliance or that fixture. A positive abatement cost means it won't pay itself back. We will still be saving energy 
and water, but we aren't going to make back that particular economic investment. And so my economics colleagues at the University of Illinois look at figures like this and inside they're kind of screaming because everything here in this negative abatement cost from their perspective is money on the table that people are not grabbing. They are not taking that money available on the table that will pay itself back over time. And what are these things? Um, these are things like low flow toilets. Well, we don't plug our toilets into the wall. They're not direct energy consumers, but they are indirect energy consumers. And that is a little skinny bar. So it's not saving as much energy. The horizontal axis here is the annual energy savings, but it is very much cost negative. So it is paying itself back over the lifetime of that particular investment. Wide bars here correspond to things like energy star windows which makes sense, right? Because we're investing so much energy in the indoor space conditioning. Then as we get over here to the right-hand side, these particular investments like refrigerators and dishwashers are not cost negative. So these are, we are spending money and not saving money in the long run, but they are still saving energy. So the most cost-effective thing for us to do would be to invest in things from the left to the right. And a lot of these are cost negative. So saving energy saves water and vice versa. This is our energy picture. The water picture is much simpler because there's a lot fewer things in our homes where water is consumed. And an important takeaway from this particular one is that all of the water investments are abatement cost negative except the Energy Star dishwasher, which is this little skinny bar here on the right, mostly because Energy Star dishwashers don't save that much water in the process of focusing on energy efficiency. There's still a decent amount of water consumption. Water perspective, this is great news. Resident efficiency investments are cost effective and they save energy in the process of saving water. And so we did this analysis, this cost abatement curve analysis for an average US household, which you might be thinking, great, but I'm not average. I'm, I'm so much more awesome than average. And we felt the same way because of this large disparity in outdoor water consumption. And so what we've been doing, and this is ongoing work, is investigating what's really happening on the water side inside the residential environment. And so we've been installing and collecting data from participant households. And right now we've got a, a demonstration deployment where we've been collecting two years and some change of data at one second resolution. And what we're trying to do here is to establish a fingerprint of different water consuming appliances and fixtures inside the home while taking fine temporal resolution measurements at the main without invading the privacy of the occupants. And I recognize that this sounds very stereotypical engineer that we want to understand what the humans are doing, but we actually don't want to interact with the humans at all. And a lot of that is because we would like to minimize bias. We would like to look at what their data are telling us, not so much what they as individuals are telling us, which is how we've previously done this in this particular line of research is to ask individuals to keep a water diary. Instead, we would like to measure their data and see what's happening. And so these are three different example fingerprints or signatures, so to speak. Um, the horizontal axes are not the same um, so keep that in mind, but the vertical axes are identical. And so something like a shower versus this is two toilet flushes back to back have a very different signature to them. The shower in this particular residence that we are studying has a large peak at the beginning of a shower at around four gallons per minute which is the bathtub part of the shower turning on. And then we see the flow rate settle down to around two and a half gallons per minute, which is what we would expect because that is the standard rating on shower heads. And so we can 
compare something like a shower to a toilet, which is more of kind of a square wave and has a flow rate much lower than that shower. These wiggly lines are very typical of collecting one second data, also typical of changes in flow um, in a, a premise plumbing situation. We're dealing with an incompressible fluid. So this, this wiggly noise of data is not unexpected. We're also, this particular study home was constructed in 1965. So we would expect to see leaks along the way. The clothes washer here, this is a one hour cycle of the clothes washer is a series of fill and drain cycles that still looks very different from something like a shower that has a very long flow associated with it. And so what we've been doing with this information is starting to understand different temporal patterns and different end use patterns. In this particular study home, there's a statistically relevant difference between weekday and weekend. That is because the occupants of this study home work a typical Monday through Friday work week. These data that we're reporting here are pre-COVID, so this would be a typical work outside the home and then come home sort of behavior. Um, this has most definitely changed in response to stay-at-home measures because the lack of water consumption during the day that you see here on in the orange weekday bar chart on the right-hand side has been replaced with more daytime water consumption as individuals are working at home or working from home. And that's, that is kind of starting to blend between weekday and weekend. Um, we see that peaks are delayed on weekends, which is consistent with broader trends that we see in water distribution networks, and that there is a a difference in those particular demand patterns, even at the single household scale. So where is water going in the home and how do we figure that out? Well, we throw a bunch of math at it and I didn't wanna throw a bunch of math on a slide because I think it's easier to describe graphically than it is with equations. So if we take a water use event, one of the challenges in collecting fine temporal resolution data is understanding when two things are happening at once. And this particular event is an example of a concurrent event. There are two things or more happening at once. And we see that with the blue line, which is the flow rate. Um, I apologize, the vertical axis is liters per minute because we published this in a journal that wanted SI units. So do some quick math if you, if you would like. This first peak, is more than likely a bathtub turning on. And then this long squiggly line here is more than likely a shower, but then something happens here. And then we go down to about zero. How do we figure out what this is and what this is, what, the, what was happening first and then what's the second concurrent event? We do that with derivatives of the flow rate. So we take the derivative of the flow rate and we look at major increases and decreases in the derivative of the flow rate because we're dealing with an incompressible fluid here. So what our algorithm does is takes the derivative, which is this orange line here, and it looks for major increases and major decreases, and it matches those to each other and says, okay, there's something that happened here. There's something that happened here at a subsequent time. Therefore, this must be an event. I will extract this event and I will dump it somewhere and I will figure out what that is. Then I will go back to matching other things and that has an, a representation of a shower. So more than likely what this is, is a bathtub turning on, then a valve turning to have a shower head flowing, and then someone has flushed a toilet. This little blip here might be something going on with a faucet or it might just be an artifact of the data collection. So that's an example of the disaggregation that we go through to then cluster and say, here's where water is going in this particular residential environment, not just any average US home, but this one in particular. And so we do a K-means clustering approach we have some limited training data with which we can label these clusters, and we start to see differences between 
the exact same toilet installed in different locations in this particular home. And the part that I think that's really exciting about this work is that we can use it to then inform a water balance around the individual residential environment to show where does it make sense to invest in water efficiency for these occupants. If we had just come in with national average values, we would make statements like, well, you should water your lawn less if you'd like to save water. Okay, but these occupants don't have a, a signature that shows much outdoor watering, which is consistent with what they've told us. But in reality, they do use a lot of water in their shower. And so instead of giving occupants information that is kind of useless for their behavioral patterns, we can instead say, a lot of your water seems to be going to the shower. And that's something that can, can be changed through either a lower flow shower head or a shorter shower. And the shower is a really interesting one because most of us are showering in hot water or warm water. So we're also saving energy by using less water in the shower. So we're really excited about these results. We're working on installing more of these metering systems in other participant homes to start to see what are different signatures along the way in different types of homes. So just to wrap up on this, this last question so that we've got plenty of time for questions, our, our second question is how are energy and water connected at the household level? And what we see is that even at the national average scale, most of our water and energy efficiency measures in the residential environment are saving money over the lifetime of that appliance and fixture. So what that means is that water efficiency is a cost-effective approach to energy efficiency, and energy efficiency is a cost-effective approach to water efficiency. So getting to Elena's earlier question about things like decarbonizing the electricity sector, we also have to think about where that electricity is going and other ways to start reducing some of that water energy carbon feedback associated with things. Looking specifically at our smart water meter data collection, we're really excited because we can use this information to create customized, customized conservation and efficiency recommendations. And so we don't have to focus exclusively on infrastructure investments for efficiency. We can also make comments around things like behavior change associated with conservation. And so the big takeaway from my perspective is that so-called smart cities or smarter cities really re require data collection and decision-making for both energy and water. Focusing exclusively on energy kind of misses some of the connective aspects with water such that we can be more water efficient and simultaneously start to achieve some of those smart energy goals along the way. I definitely want to acknowledge all of my uh, now former students who have done a lot of this work. So the, the city scale water and wastewater utility data collection was led by Chris Cheney, who has finished his PhD and is now an assistant professor at the Air Force Institute of Technology. The smart water meter work was led by a uh, master's student, Gabrielle Bethke, who now works at ComEd in the Chicago area, and uh, two undergraduate researchers, Abigail Cohen and Micah Stickling, who worked on the installation and indoor water audit for our initial study home. Our research is uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation and also by the Siebel Energy Institute. So I am very happy to take any of your questions. It looks like some have come in on the Q&A and the chat. If you have questions or want to contact me beyond this particular webinar environment, you're more than welcome to reach out to me over email or Twitter if you must. Um, I, I'm not that witty on Twitter, but sometimes it's the best way to have conversations. Um, so you, you're welcome to reach out to me in any capacity. And with that, I will, I will stop and we can do questions. Great. Thanks so much, Ashlyn. That was a terrific presentation. I, I'm sorting the questions okay. um, in sort of three categories. I think we'll start at the household level where you left off. And I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind putting back up uh, the abatement curves. Uh, sure. Again, we're, there's a couple yeah, questions yeah, yeah. about that. So we'll start at the household and then maybe go to sort of utility city and then up to broad macro policy recommendations. Um, so the first question about the abatement curve, trying to understand um, if you could explain a little bit more the, the costs, are these relative to other 
Energy Star appliances or like the conventional cost on the market or is it just pure payback? Like, do you expect the incremental savings in energy to pay back the cost of the appliance over time? How is that coming? Yeah, yeah, good question. So if an efficiency investment were cost negative, we would expect that the price that we pay for the appliance over that lifetime would be less than the cost that we would have paid for a similar non-efficient appliance in energy and water for that particular appliance. And we're looking at what happens at the property scale itself. So if my refrigerator is busted and I need to buy a new refrigerator, I could get the cheapest, least efficient thing at Lowe's and Home Depot, or I could get the most efficient thing that I can find. Yep. And that's the beauty of these Energy Star or WaterSense labels, because they tell me how much I, I, they meet a certain performance standard. And so we compare those two. And generally speaking, it is, it is always cheaper to buy the least efficient appliance. And that additional upfront investment cost should, in theory, be something that I can recoup over time by paying less in electricity. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. And this is like the same problem that electric vehicles are now facing with like a higher yeah. upfront sticker price, yeah. but much lower maintenance costs over time. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And I, that, that's a really good point. So I'm um, one of the one of the things I said is that economists get frustrated because this is money, free money right. on the table, but that upfront investment cost is nothing to sneeze at for a lot of people. Right. Um, even even for people that were not so economically crippled by the broken refrigerator, that that upfront is a, oof, that's that's a lot to stomach because I wasn't planning on paying that. Yep. So that was the next question is about how some of these McKinsey curves are actually driving the structure of incentives for, you know, rebate programs around some of these, you know, energy efficient and water efficient appliances. And I'm sure that must factor in, but um, yeah, thinking about that and how we could combine that with some of these, you know, uh, low income water and energy efficiency savings programs. Um, yeah, yeah, like yeah those, the, those are good questions. So in, in that particular work, we did explore rebates and um, we talked to a handful of cities that had offered rebates on things. And we heard some interesting things. Um, cities don't necessarily like to incentivize things that people are already doing on their own. So one particular um, manager that we talked to said, oh yeah, we used to offer rebates on front loader high efficiency washing machines, but then we realized people bought that anyway. And so they quit offering that particular rebate because that was, that was a behavior that they didn't need to incentivize. Um, another interesting example that we saw was a natural gas utility that was offering free low flow shower heads, which is an interesting connection yep. between water heating and hot water consumption in yep. showers. Yep. So uh, some, of those, some of those rebates are starting to pick up on that and those incentives of um, discounts on utility bills or things like yeah. If, if you bring us your seven gallon per flush toilet, we'll give you a free dual flush toilet. Yeah. 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 So another household level question, mm -hmm. trying to understand um, the different, this, the water loss figures, by mm -hmm. the way, are just, I mean, it's staggering. Like to think about being able to find <laughs> a mid-sized city on the energy savings of that water loss alone. It's just really, that was very powerful data to see. Um, so we're trying to understand the difference between non-revenue water and non-metered water. What's the relationship there because you know we have some amount of water loss everywhere but you know mm -hmm. taking Chicago and where Chicago falls on the sort of east to west spectrum right of like we're not relatively losing as much as some of our older east coast counterparts but um how do, should we think about water loss and the difference that a meter makes really great question um which now makes me wonder how did we how did Chicago have that number that they reported to us because normally um utilities will have a really good handle on what they issue bills for because that's what they're in the business of doing and they know what they treated at the drinking water treatment plant and so a, a simple arithmetic between them will tell you what is lost so to speak mm -hmm. but there is there is a difference between a physical loss from something like a water main break or a an authorized but non-metered loss 
would be something like fire hydrants, um, drinking fountains at parks, those those legitimate uses of water, but are not mm -hmm. metered necessarily because uh, in a municipality setting, those typically don't have meters on them. Um, Non-metered residences introduce a lot of challenges to this. When we don't measure what is being consumed in the residential environment, it is really difficult to manage what is happening in the residential yeah. environment. And, and I know that installation of residential water meters has run into many, many hiccups in oh, yeah. the city of yeah. Chicago and water quality is a very important consideration. Absolutely. But it's it's yeah. difficult to be able to say, where are we? as a city and how do we get better if right. we don't know what we're doing right, right. Uh, that's why there's been such a big move to put in more smart meters and all of that but yeah that's right. that's helpful i think it answers that question um so moving to some of the utility scale questions of uh, the energy uh, that you were tracking are it's not capturing energy from like elsewhere in the treatment supply chain right like the cost of energy to produce chemicals involved in treatment. It's just the pure electricity or natural gas for heating or cooling, whatever's yeah. needed. Yeah, we were, we were looking at what happens on the property of the city itself. Uh, we did contact private utilities because I live in Champaign and we have a private water utility. They did not respond to us at all. <laughs> okay. uh, do you have a sense for um, of the wastewater utilities um, that responded, how many are doing some form of energy recovery? We did ask, yeah. yeah, yeah, we did ask that because um, that was that was something we knew going in, and we wanted to try and capture that. Um, all of our data for that particular analysis are publicly available online, and I think we did quantify biogas generation of the utilities that responded to us. And I, if I remember correctly, it was kind of a, a binary: do you use it beneficially? or yep. do you flare it? Um, so for those that are, are generating biogas, a beneficial reuse is an option typically associated with scale. And we've got a, a biased sample size anyway, because we started with large cities and large utilities. So that they're more likely to be able to capture and beneficially use biogas or any sort of energy recovery system. Okay, great, thanks to that question. Um, great, so how, how should we be thinking about pinpointing our responses? I'm trying to kind of sum up a lot of questions into our final minute here. Um, given that it is very complicated to see the relationships between these different sources of energy and water use, um, what are some of the frontiers that you see in terms of policy, either individual incentives for to shape consumer decisions of demand, but also at this sort of very large scale potential of the building footprint, utility footprint, are there are there things that you see as, as really promising as we, you know, all of us cities need to figure out how we're going to meet our great decarbonization requirements and our, our sort of climate goals. So it seems really topical and right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a big question. And I think there's, I see lots of glimmers of hope that we are connecting these dots together and are no longer thinking about things in silos. And that's, that's really been a pivot in the last 15 years or so where an energy bill, for example, would have a hyper focus on something like biofuels, for example, that can and has been demonstrated to be very detrimental for water, specifically water quality. And those, those cascading ripple effects were something that we kind of understood, but we didn't really understand that the scale at which that plays out until after we'd implemented those energy policies. There's also now starting to be a lot more energy and water policies coming together such that we're thinking about those. Um, I get excited and nerd out about stuff like showerhead efficiency because I see that as low hanging fruit. It is a, an important part of what we consider to be creature comfort, but also a, a connection, a direct connection within the home. And to the extent that we can start to both incentivize large scale change in our infrastructure and decarbonization at a large scale and individuals taking personal responsibility for things, I think, I think both of those coming together are important. Right. And it sounds like 
advances in you know the data collection, but probably also AI and machine learning that can help identify some of these yeah. patterns as we get more data. All sound really promising. I know we've seen a lot more interest in like leak detection technologies and things that are really pinpointing some of these like high value loss areas where you know hopefully we can make that cost really clear and then start to invest in some of the solutions that will yes. manage that. So um, thank you so much. We are out of time. There are a lot more questions and I know there are people who are going to want to engage with you. Um, so please feel free to do that. And if Ashlyn, I don't know, let's see if you want to drop your contact information in the chat, um, you could go ahead and do that as I wrap us up here with just a few words in closing. I hope everyone will save the date. If you haven't already, we're going to be uh, celebrating one year of the Third Coast Water Seminar Series, actually, at the next Chicago Water Week, which will be October 11th through 15th. We are still accepting program partners. We have a great lineup of folks already um, signed up to deliver programming during that week. So please uh, stay tuned, save the date, and uh, pitch us your program ideas. We also will have another Third Coast Water Seminar coming up at the end of August uh, with Dr. Cliff Davidson from Syracuse talking about green roofs and hydrologic performance of green roofs. So that'll be a really exciting tie back, especially as we think about how we can all spend less water keeping our lawns green, right? What are the ways we could do that with native plantings and other things? So um, great tie in between these presenters. Thank you again so much to uh, Dr. Stilwell for a wonderful presentation. Oh, thanks, George has just popped up a poll. Um, so if you stuck around with us to this point, please go ahead and fill that out. We really appreciate participant and attendee feedback to help make these uh, and other events even more dynamic and engaging for you. So thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day. We'll see you on the next Third Coast Water Seminar.